Hello, I'm Nate Eaton with EastIdahoNews.com. Joining me now via FaceTime is Tom Christofferson. He has recently published a book called That We May Be One. Uh, Mr. Christofferson, thanks for being with us today. First of all, why, why did you decide to write this book? I wanted to share the experience that uh, my family and I had as I came out to them about 30 years ago as a gay man. And, uh, and then much more recently experience that my LDS congregation and I had when I was living in McKean, Connecticut, as I started to return to church. You wrote this book about your experience being gay, being Mormon. Uh, when you came out to them years ago, you decided to leave the church? I did. I, um, I couldn't quite figure at that point out to be uh, gay and Mormon, so I figured I'd try to be gay and happy. And how did that go? Uh, good, it was a, a journey. <laughs> uh, and, you know, for the next probably 25 years, I didn't have a lot to do with the church, but, uh, you know, I had a very happy life and felt satisfied in many areas of my life. And increasingly came to feel that I was lacking something, that there was a high purpose, deep for meaning that I wanted to explore. And that's when I felt the desire to start going back to church. So you came out. Uh your family was active Latter-day Saints, and what was their response? My uh, parents, I, I believe, sought guidance through prayer, how best to lead our family through the process and received an answer, and that was that to be totally inclusive, that uh, my partner and I were welcome and involved in every family activity and event, uh, welcome in their home, they were welcome in our home, and it was, a, for me, a great way to approach it because it meant there were no barriers, that we could be fully engage with each other without any impediment. Over the years, as you're in this relationship, did you ever think about going back to your Mormon faith? I did uh, in the latter years, and I, as I said, the, you know, my feeling at a certain point was that despite a very happy life, there was uh, more to be had in a, in a spiritual sense, and a, a desire for finding deeper meaning. And that was when I began to uh, return to the church uh, that I had grown up in, the LDS Church. And you write in your book that we may be one, that you and your partner, I believe, started to go to the Mormon ward and, and people were quite welcoming. They were very much. When I first started to go, I would just sneak in in the back and right after the meeting started and leave as soon as it was over and not really talk to anyone. But after some weeks of doing that, I asked to speak to the local bishop of the congregation and uh, we met and I said to him, look, here's the story. My partner and I have been together for 12 years and, or so whatever it was in a monogamous relationship. Uh, but I have made a commitment to him. I don't feel like I can make other commitments at this point. I'd like to be able to worship with the Latter-day Saints. Would you be amenable to that? And he said, absolutely. Please come join us and bring your partner if he'll come. We'd like to know him too. And that really was the, the sense of welcome that I received there. So you were excommunicated in 1985. At what point did you decide, I think I want to be baptized again? It was after I'd been going back to church for about five years. I, I did, over time, really develop a desire to be able to participate more fully. And uh, talked to my bishop and stake president about that and what that would mean. And, uh, and then my state president asked my partner if he would come in and have a visit with him and talk to him about why baptism was important to me and what it meant. And asked his feelings. And my partner, uh, in a short version, wasn't really high on that idea. And so the state president said to me, I don't think this is the right time. I think you two should talk about it. And if it ever comes to a point where that seems the right process for both of you, then we'll talk about it again. So it was about a year later when my partner felt that uh, he wanted me to do what was what I thought would be the right thing for me, and he would then need to figure out what that meant for him. And that would mean that you all would end, end your relationship, or at least uh, the f physical aspects of your relationship? What would that mean? Right, the, the physical aspect had, had changed, obviously, to, to be qualified for baptism, but uh, my hope had been that our, over a long period of relationship that that the emotional connection that we shared was really so powerful and, and valuable that we would want to maintain that. Uh, and, and we did for a time, but that really wasn't a really happy outcome for my partner. And he felt that he would rather 
be able to you know end the relationship and, and see what that what you might find otherwise so i read too that when you all decided to call things off your family was sad it was like losing a member of the family of course after you know nearly two decades uh, my, my brothers and sisters-in-law and my parents had come to really love him and he them and my nieces and nephews considered him another uncle so it was, a, it was hard so some members of the family have stayed in contact with him and, and some have not but i think we all miss him it was a great addition to our family do you uh, you know keep in touch with him anymore we do not, not as often as i my life but we do one of the things that, of course, has caught the attention of a lot of people with this book is your relationship to Elder D. Todd Christofferson. He's a member of the LDS Church's Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Uh, what, what was your relationship like with him during your journey? We've always been close. He, he was very loving and uh, inclusive in, in his way of dealing with us. I don't think we have doubted what he believed or, or how he uh, felt about uh, the church's policies and doctrine, but you know, he was very loving to us, and we appreciate it. And what did he think when you said, "I'm getting rebaptized. I'm coming back"? <laughs> well, it had been uh, speaking with him and with my other brothers and my parents along that process. Uh, in the couple of years before I was baptized, that both of my parents had passed away, but. Uh, you know, they, they knew that I was where I was in this process and were very supportive. So what did you think back in November of 2015 when the policy came out saying that uh, if you, you know, are in a gay relationship, you're considered apostates, and if you have children who are under 18, they can't get baptized into the LDS Church unless they disavow their parents' relationship? It was, uh, it was surprising to me. I certainly hadn't expected it. And when it was first uh, brought out in social media, I thought it was a rumor and somebody had it wrong. Um, as I write in the book, the, the next day I was in Utah and had gone to the symphony, and my brother Todd, uh, Elder Christopherson, called me. And then I, at, at the interval of the performance, I stepped out in the lobby, called him back, and told me that he had recorded an interview with Mike Otterson, who was at the time the head of public affairs for the LDS Church, to try and provide a little more information or background about the policy. And he said to me, you know, I think knowing that so many people that I love deeply would be quite hurt, he said, you know, if you feel the need to distance yourself from me because of this, I will certainly understand. And I said to him, look, it can't have been easy for you to have a gay brother who's pretty public. Uh, and, I, and you've never distanced yourself from me. I have no intention of putting any distance between us either. Wow. So do you want the church's policy to change, and do you think it ever will? I don't know. My, my feeling has been that uh, I'm torn. Uh, people that I love who are same-sex couples have gotten married, and I've been happy to be at their ceremonies. Some have children who know. In, in my experience, that's been a stabilizing, solidifying factor for families. Um, on the other hand, I believe in prophets, seers, and revelators, and their ability to see what I cannot. And so I can see both sides of this and, and have not been able to fully reconcile in my own mind. I continue to study it, pray about it, and hope that someday that I'll have clarity. And, and do you think, do you ever, you know, sit down with your brother at dinner and say, let's discuss this, you know, you think this is going to change? I mean, do those conversations happen or, or do you kind of avoid the topic? No, I, we, we talk a lot and I'm really grateful that he's always willing to listen to me and hear my thoughts. I'm always appreciative when he shares his with me. So I, I feel very grateful for the, the connection that we have. We talked a little before we started rolling about the reaction since this book has, has come out or is coming out. And, and, and what has that been like for you amongst members of the LDS Church and members who are in the LGBT community? It's, you know, I would say the, the many of the people who have reached out to me or 
who I've spoken with have done felt about it exactly as I had hoped, which is that it's a, it sparks a better conversation than we've had before, where the far ends on each side are yelling at each other. But really there's a conversation we had about how can we as families be closer together, be more loving, be more united, and how can word families or congregations do the same thing and really make space for individuals wherever they might be in their journey. Um, other folks I've heard have been very concerned that, uh, that this book, the fact that it's published by Deseret Book, uh, the fact of my last name, you know, might mean that it, it gets taken as this is the only path or this is the right path. And I've tried very hard to say, look, this is my experience. I'm very grateful for it, but it's the journey I've had and where I have felt guided to go. And anyone else who reads it should find what their path is and where they feel inspired to, to go in their lives. And, you know, my experience isn't a template or a how-to guide for anyone else. It's really, the book is really intended to be some experiences that might offer suggestions or ideas to other people as they prayerfully seek to find the way that will be best for their families or for themselves. And do you feel welcome and wanted since, you know, you've kind of become a public figure in, in your ward among members of the church? I, I felt I was welcome and wanted before I became one. <laughs> and now, now they're kind enough to ignore all the stuff around it and just treat me as me. Well, good. And your reaction from the LGBT, commu LGBT community, are there some that feel like you might be a, a traitor or that you uh, are denying your true self? I think some do. And, you know, for some who have, in their history, been members of the LDS Church, you know, some feel that they've got uh, wounds that are very real and raw from, from experiences that were not as happy as mine have been. And, you know, for them, it's very hard to hear something that suggests that there could be a place for them in the church. And so I, you know, I want to be sure that we're letting everyone tell their story and open to hear what anyone's experience has been so we can learn together and grow together. Well, Tom Christofferson, we appreciate you for joining us from your home in Salt Lake City. Again, the name of the book is That We May Be One, and you can pick it up uh, online, Deseret Book, uh, a few other stores. And we appreciate you talking with us here at EastIdahoNews.com. My pleasure. Thank you.